The second case on the docket for Tuesday, February 1st, 2022, is appeal number 122897, State of Kansas versus Melvin LaVon Shields, Wyandotte County, briefs both sides. We are ready to proceed, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Kai Mann of the Appellate Defender Office, here representing Melvin Shields, ready and present for argument. Uh, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to now. May I please reserve three minutes for rebuttal? You Thank you. Three minutes is reserved. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, the state of Kansas appears by Special Prosecutor Daniel Obermeyer, present and ready for argument. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Justice demands reversal of Melvin Shields' convictions for premeditated murder, as this prosecution was deeply flawed, beginning, middle, and end. These errors denied Mr. Shields his constitutional rights and set the stage for the greatest injustice, conviction on insufficient evidence. These errors will be discussed in three overarching categories, keeping in mind that the effect of these errors on top of being reversible individually, are also intertwined such that they are also reversible cumulatively. Those three categories are fundamental due process error, consisting of the uh, pre insufficient evidence and the pre-charging delay as, issue, as argued in issues one and two. Inflammatory error, uh, the irrelevant images and the prosecutorial error as argued in uh, issues three and six, and instructional error, the lack of eyewitness instruction, and the erroneous aiding and embedding instruction as argued in issues four and five. Now, beginning with the insufficient evidence, the facts of this case are really show how insufficient this evidence is. On April 27th, 1988, Stephen Ray and Jolene Jones were last seen midday. Later that same day, Reginald Reed, Mrs. Jones' cousin, twice sees Mrs. Jones' car, claiming to see Mr. Shields in the car with, other, with others both times. The next day, April 28th, the bodies of, Mr. Jones and Ms., er, of Ms. Jones and Mr. Ray were found, both deceased of a gunshot wound. The time of death could not be determined, and autopsies and biological evidence were collected that same day. The next day, April 29th, Mrs. Jones' vehicle was found. Fingerprints and cigarette butts were seized from the, fr from, from the vehicle. Eventually, those were matched to Mr. Shields, as, as well as the biological evidence recovered from Mrs. Jones. Also, a cigarette butt containing DNA from a third person was also found. And that's basically it. And we see the problem here is that there is no evidence that Mr. Shields killed anybody. And even if there was, there is no evidence that he did so intentionally, and certainly no evidence that he did so with premeditation. When we go to, when we look at the exact elements that the state needed to prove on this case, they needed to prove that the killings were committed intentionally. We have no evidence. Maliciously, again, no evidence. Deliberately with premeditation, no evidence. Counsel, can I yes. interrupt you? You say there's no evidence that the murder was intentional or that your client was the individual that intentionally murdered the victims? I think both. I think that given the, the amount of time we have here between the disappearance of the bodies and where they're recovered, we don't have any sort of circumstances as to how these killings occurred except for there's a gunshot wound. And even there, we have some kind of things that don't exactly line up. Well, the state could say, well, you know, there are three shots to Mr. Ray. This has to be intentional. Well, there's only one shot to Ms. Jones. So right, but I, there's also DNA evidence that links uh, your client if I understand correctly, to um, JJ's death, uh, or at least to the crimes that, uh, the sex crimes that, that were charged in the case. Sure. Well, one, it's, there was no sex crime charge. There was a felony oh. murder based on a sex crime because, you know, the statute of limitations had run on right. everything but the murders. Right. Uh, but the, but even then, I, I will, I will grant that one could make a weak inference that Mr. Shields was involved in a robbery and a rape, given the fingerprints, the, the DNA, and, and the cigarette butts. However, to get from there 
to the and premeditated intentional murder, you have to make an inference that Mr. Joan, that Mr. Shields was involved in a murder and a rape, which means he must have killed these people, which means he must have intended, which means that he must have premeditated it. And those three last parts are just founded upon inference stacked upon inference without really anything going for them. Well, what about the aiding and abetting liability, Howard? Is that, is that enough for the state to overcome your argument? I do not think so, uh, particularly because, one, there's insufficient evidence to give that aiding and abetting. The only evidence we have of aiding and abetting is Mr. Reed's statement that he saw the vehicle with others uh, before the bodies were found, and then also the fact that there's that third cigarette butt. However, the car was found 24 hours after the body was found, and so that cigarette butt could have left anywhere. So that instruction was not factually appropriate, and even if that instruction was factually appropriate, that instruction also admitted that Mr. Shields also had to have the requisite premeditation. So even if the aiding and abetting were to save it, the aiding and abetting instruction was so weak and so erroneous that it cannot save this case here. And again, we just kind of go, this kind of works into the cumulative error part because this is, when we look at a case like this and there's hardly any evidence, and I'm up here arguing insufficient evidence, really that raises a secondary question. What did the jury find? Well, in this case, we have the poorly instructed jury regarding the eyewitness instruction, and especially that aiding and abetting, which was both, one, factually inappropriate, and two, legally inappropriate. And then when we have on top of it the inflammatory images and the prosecutorial error, we have a verdict that is not the product of calm and rational looking at the evidence, but we have a verdict that is, that is basically the product of error. And so that's where all this cumulative error comes in, although all of these, I, all of these errors individually are also reversible, particularly given the lack of evidence there. This is not one of those overwhelming evidence cases. As I wrote, as I wrote in the brief, and I still stand here today, there's only evidence connecting Mr. Shields to a crime scene. There is no evidence connecting Mr. Shields to premeditated first degree murder. And this is particularly true when we look at the elements of, at the factors that this court has previously used to determine premeditation. There's five of them. The only one that's present here is the nature of the weapon. I cannot deny that they were shot. <laughs> but as this court has said in Crosby, the nature of the weapon cannot be the only factor supporting premeditation. So when we look at the other ones, a lack of provocation. Again, we have this 24 hour period before the bodies are found. We have no idea what happened. Uh, when we go to the defendant's conduct before and after the killing, same problem. We have literally no idea what this conduct is. Again, threats and declarations of the of the defendant prior to the occurrence, there's no evidence that Mr. Shields even knows these people, much less, much less knows enough to get to threaten them. And again, the dealing of lethal blows after the deceased was helpless. We know nothing about how these killings occurred except for they shot. We don't even know where these killings occurred. Again, when we look at the mud, there is no mud if you look at State's, State's Exhibit 3 that, that could be picked up. If they were killed there, then why was there blood on the seat samples as the state argued in their closing and argued throughout? they had to have been somewhere else unless they were shot there, put in the car, and taken back out, and that doesn't make any sense. It's just the matter of the fact is, is that I, had, I understand the DNA finding is, is inflammatory. That, that is a hard finding. But when you look at the actual elements of the crime that Mr. Shields was convicted of, there's just simply no evidence supporting these. Um, and again, when we go back to how this case was, was, was presented, this is, this is a case of classic inference stacking. And I know I just mentioned that, but again, we have this inference. And again, I don't even think it's a very strong inference, but we have this inference that could be made about a rape and a robbery. But that just simply can't get a person to premeditate an intentional murder. Uh, that ju just can't without filling in gaps or imagining scenarios, which you know this court has said in Chandler, you just can't do because they're not certain enough. Um, so I You don't think yeah. that if that... Uh, evidence that um, an individual has been raped and then shot in the head uh, at close range does not support premeditation? Not for Mr. Shields. No, it does not. It could be somebody. And again, I, I don't even think Why, that... But aren't those two different... When inference stacking is coming to the same conclusion. Whether Mr. Shields was the one that did this, how, you know, you make inferences on that, but on whether or not it was pre premeditated, can't you just take the facts, you know, for example, number one, um, Ray was shot three times. That's evidence of, you can make an inference from that. You don't have to stack anything. You make an inference from that. 
you shoot somebody three times, it's premeditated. Someone is raped and then shot at close range. You don't think that that supports premeditation? Well, except we don't know about the close range because the doctor in this case testified that there was no gunshot residue around around the wound. I, okay, I, so let's take out that it right, was Right, well, again, and, and, and we're also assuming that these people were shot at the same time at the same place. Well, again, that's not true. And in fact, there is an, there is a, an inference of a rape, but that inference is not a very... It's two separate people and two separate charges. So why couldn't you make the inference based on three times being shot, premeditated there, rape and shot premeditated there. Because then you're making this inference that three shots equal premeditation over here, but one shot equals premeditation over here. So, one so, shot so, so, after a rape. But we do not know that. And frankly, that's actually assuming that the semen was left before she was deceased. And, and I do not mean to be graphic or shocking, but that's just the case. We don't have any information as to how these things went down. We just simply don't have any. And even if we well, did... we have information that she was left there uh, with her... Uh, I mean, it, there, was, there, were other, there was other evidence of rape besides just the fact that she had sexual intercourse, right? I mean, I think that one could make the inference that with the positioning of her panties and her hose, that rape could happen. But again, being raped at that spot, at that ditch, I don't think anybody could make that habit, be, could make that inference because that positioning of the body could easily be found by two people carrying a body and dropping it in a ditch, one person under the knees, one person under the shoulders, and furthermore, and most importantly, there is no evidence that one of those people was Mr. Shields. So basically you're saying that unless you have direct evidence connecting someone to uh, a murder scene, you can't convict anybody. No, I am not. I, I, my position would be that evidence of a rape is not evidence of premeditated murder without any other evidence going to premeditation or murder. You can't assume so that. So it's your position that you, you can't make an inference because you can make an inference that she was raped, um, but that somebody shot her later. Sure, and that can inference can be made, but no inference can be made that Mr. Shields was the one who shot or Mr. Shields That's was the one. That's a separate issue, isn't it? No, it's not when, when we get to convictions of premeditated murder. There has to be evidence supporting all the elements of premeditated murder, and anything that gets you to premeditation, using the factors that this court has found, is simply a, assuming and, a, and assuming situations and filling in gaps that have no evidentiary support. Um, I see I don't have much time. I would just like to... Uh, hit the uh, due process charging a little bit. You know, one case I want to remind this court of is, is Sherman, believe it or not, the prosecutorial error. Because we have the same issues in the second prong of the royal test. One, which is based on a misreading of Marion, which, we, which I discussed in the brief. But two, we kind of get into that same problem where we're pigeonholing this, these types of errors that take the focus away from the prejudice suffered by the defendant and basically make the rights depend on the intent of the state. And furthermore, whether the state intended a tactical advantage or not really is a question that should exist beyond the four corners of this criminal appeal. That should be a question more for a disciplinary panel, if necessary, as this court you know, noted in Sherman. But at the end of the day, Mr. Shields was prejudiced, the state has no reason, and without any reason, this court should find that a due process violation has occurred. Counsel, what, what was the district court's finding the district court's finding that was that Mr. Shields was prejudiced, declined to put a quantum on it, but that there was no evidence of a tactical advantage well, sought that, by the state. It, it seems to me like it, it, the ruling says something along the lines of, it's, it's hard for me not it, it, to say that it, it, there it, it, was prejudice it, it, it over is hard. 12 years. <laughs> It is hard to find that there is no prejudice, which is exactly the same phrasing that the district court used when it talked about tactical delay or tactical advantage. It is hard to find that the state did this to gain a tactical advantage. So using that same phrasing twice, we can see that the district court did find some prejudice. It just didn't quantify how much, but ultimately dismissed because of that tactical advantage. And furthermore, had the district court, the, that the district court engaged with the tactical advantage prong shows that there was prejudice because without prejudice, there's no need to engage in that prong. But it looks like the ruling from the bench, he's, he says there's no prejudice. I, I, I disagree with that, particularly when the state points out how many witnesses have died. Um, so to the fact that the district court did find there was no prejudice, I would say that that ruling is not supported by stamp, substantial competent evidence. We have Frank Scott, the primary suspect, who's well, deceased. Do we have that record? Yes. Of the hearing? We do, and I, and I added the, the, uh, the testimony of James Brunt. That, was, that should be in the record now. It should be. Okay. 
it should be in the record. I, I, I know it was designated. I yes, just having a hard time I, locating we, 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 it. Yes, and when I checked, I had our office staff check with Wyandotte County okay. prior to this argument, and they said that the, it had been added to the to the record. Uh, but if it is not, I can certainly take steps to, to continue that. Um, I see that I am out of time. Uh, I would just like to end by requesting that this court reverse Mr. Shields' convictions and vacate them, and if necessary, and the alternative, to remand for a new trial. Thank you. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, the evidence in this case shows definitively that the defendant, Melvin Shields, brutally murdered after having raped JJ, both her and Steve Ray, on April 27, 1988. Some additional facts which uh, show that it is the defendant, and this court can be confident that it is the defendant. Um, JJ and the Reverend Ray were in a relationship. They had had a child in common due to that relationship. And on the day in question, they had arranged to meet up for lunch um, or supposedly so that uh, Reverend Ray could give some money for the support of their child. Um, the last time anyone saw JJ alive again was uh, after she dropped off her child with her sister. Um, after saying goodbye to her mother at their place of work, uh, she drove off in her distinctive red Pontiac, um, which was a uh, very, which was known to be her vehicle, which her family identified as her vehicle. Uh, Reverend Ray left his job um, approximately 1240, according to the transcript, um, and neither of them were ever seen alive again. Can they, you clarify something for me? You're referring to one of the victims as Reverend Ray. Was yes. He, was that, was that how he was um, identified and characterized during trial. Was he, was he called Reverend Ray? Uh, that's my recollection. Um, Reverend Ray, Steve Ray. Um, well, that, that's important to me in terms of the closing argument regarding okay. how the body was found. Was there evidence that he was there a minister, is, a reverend, whatever, uh, associated with, with uh, re, um, being a reverend during the trial? Or, or how was that developed? I believe that that is in uh, the trial transcript itself. It is also in the um, interview which Detective Mast and Detective Kern had with uh, the defendant. Um, I believe that's in the record on appeal. Um, jury heard or heard him referred to that as a reverend. It just didn't come out in closing argument is my point. Um, I, I apologize, Justice Rosen. It's hard for me to pinpoint exactly when that came just, about. Your, your reference to him in, in that way, I was just wondering if that's how right. he was typically referred to at trial. You don't know. It's how... <laughs> Well, in the course of the case, that's how um, he was referred to. Um, I believe there are um, certainly, it's well, it's well known he was a reverend, but I believe that that was made, um, at least sticking out in my mind, the interview with uh, the defendant, with Detective Mass and Detective Young, um, when they're inquiring if he attends any churches, and I do believe they're talking about um, Reverend Steve Ray. The court has that exhibit. Um, I'm confused by that. Is there any evidence in the record that the defendant knew that uh, the victim was a pastor at the time of the killing? Well, no. There is no direct. There's no direct evidence that the defendant knew either. So why are you talking about? Why is the prosecutor talking about crucifixion and and the pastor and all that? It can't possibly link to the defendant if there's no evidence that shows the defendant knew that the victim was a pastor, right? Well, a pastor is a public person. Um, but you're speculating that, that the defendant would know something familiar, you know, of information that's just circulating in the community. Is that what you're saying is a fair prosecutorial closing argument? Well, as I was saying, a pastor is a public figure, much like a judge or even an attorney. Um, that's, that could be common knowledge. It could be not common knowledge. And the way that the, that was phrased in closing argument, the crucifixion, um, look, at how, uh, <laughs> look at how the body was left. I did. I did. But I'm still trying to figure out what it's doing in this case. I mean, the jury can see the photograph. I don't understand why we're talking about it in closing argument in, in, in any kind of discussion about the defendant's guilt if the defendant didn't know that this was a pastor. Well, 
I would submit that that's a reasonable inference for it to be known that he is a pastor um, if he is a, per, a public personage. Um, if you hold yourself out to the public as a pastor, yes, that's fairly common that people will refer to you as a pastor, and it's common that that's going to be known not just in your congregation, but at large. But no, I can't prove directly that the defendant knew um, that Reverend Ray was a pastor. Um, Is there any evidence in the record about how um, uh, prominent the victim's uh, position in the community was as a pastor? There is not. Essentially, that, that argument's founded on <coughs> evidence that he was, in fact, a reverend and the position of the bodies. Yes, essentially. So based on those two pieces of evidence, you're making the inference that uh, the defendant knew uh, the victim was a pastor. Yes, that was um, the intent well, behind that. Why is that a reasonable inference from those two pieces of evidence? Well, I mean, this court has said that uh, prosecutors are fair to use cultural or literary references in closing argument. Um, if nothing else, uh, crucifixion, its association, um, with Christianity as a cultural reference. It's not necessarily an impassioned religious plea. It's pointing out a connection um, between a book and um, a fact that uh, the jury has before it, well, two facts the jury has before it, that he is a pastor and that he's left this way in the open in this very degrading position, um, as is J.J., And the point, and the ultimate point, is that um, the reason that they're left there is because this isn't accidental, this is intentional, this is premeditated, that whoever killed them intentionally left them that way, which is a fair inference from the record. And was that the purpose of the, that argument in context? Was It was in the midst of arguing support for a finding of premeditation and intentional action as opposed to um, some sort of a hate crime? Uh, yes, that actually, um, when I read that in uh, the defendant's brief, I left my head scratching because that is absolutely not what I was trying to argue. Um, if I was going to say this motivation for this was a hate crime, I would have said the motivation for this was a hate crime. I had no evidence for that. I did not argue that. And as a matter of fact, when I made that statement of crucifixion, I don't know how I could have left that more to the jury's um, discretion. I basically said, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the crucifixion. I'd suggest to you that this looks like it. I didn't say that the defendant crucified this pastor. I didn't use any inflammatory language. What I was saying was that this is, a, this is an inference. I submit to you the jury is a reasonable one. You are free to accept or reject it. And that, that's all it was. It was not a plea to convict it based on some hate crime. It was not me saying I have personal knowledge of the defendant's motivation. This was... If nothing else, the court wants to reduce it to this, which is fine. It's a literary illusion um, as to what the jury can see and how the bodies are left and the victim's status, his profession, his job. Counsel, just moving a little, would you agree that a cautionary eyewitness instruction would have been legally appropriate? Legally appropriate. Um, would it have been factually appropriate? It's, that's a... The legally, on the legally appropriate, um, and this is where I always confuse myself, I would submit that it's not, it wouldn't be legally appropriate because um, Reginald Reed's uh, testimony was not material to the case. In fact, that was something, he had failed to identify the defendant from two previous lineups. I think that was clear from uh, the examination, um, cross-examination of him. And so it's your position that he was not a critical witness, and so it was no. not. No, he was not a critical witness. I mean, the critical evidence in this case was obviously the DNA and the finger. That's what led police to identify the defendant um, as a um, suspect in this case. Reginald Reed, um, if we had just had his evidence, would never have led to a conviction of the defendant. And... 
I say that, the importance of Reginald Reed's testimony was uh, shortly after Jolene and, or, I'm sorry, JJ and the Reverend Ray go missing, he sees uh, JJ's car being driven by two men whom he does not know. Uh, he notices the car is damaged and they're cleaning the car. They're cleaning mud off the car. He knows this car, he knows that it is not damaged typically, and he knows that uh, JJ does not, uh, that she always keeps it in a very clean condition. Um, so he confronts those men. And those are details that he was consistent with, both at the time they went missing and at the time of trial. Um, that's the real essential. Um, oh, I importance. understand. I... Yeah. So, and, as, and insofar as I did rely on, you know, Reginald Reed's in court identification at trial. That was corroborated by the other evidence. The fingerprint evidence indicated that the defendant um, was, in the, was in JJ's vehicle, uh, as did the DNA, test, uh, the DNA evidence from the cigarette butts. Um, that corroborates the defendant's presence in JJ's. But by saying that it corroborates that, isn't that mean he was a critical witness? I really just don't get that, you know. I mean, I can't see that there would be any, I mean, you, he seemed to be a pretty important witness. Uh, as because I, given he had two prior misidentifications, why would you call him if he wasn't critical? Again, for the cleaning of uh, JJ's vehicle, that is the important so thing. So it wasn't have to do with the fact that even on the aiding and abetting charge, that he was seen with three other people twice in the next 24 hours by your witness. That's, that is important, um, that, yes, and then for the, um, and just uh, to be clear, um, my recollection of the record is that he just sees uh, two men cleaning the, the vehicle shortly after J.J. and Reverend Ray go missing, and... Um, then that night he sees three people. And then, and then three, and then he sees three later. Um, and, and they're fleeing from him. Correct, yes. Um, but that wasn't important, that testimony... The fact that he was fleeing? Well, that, again, um, <laughs> disassociating the identification from the other uh, testimony, seeing the car, seeing men in the car, seeing men clean the car. Uh, his identification in court, I mean, it's, it's con the DNA evidence is the important evidence which identifies the defendant in this case. That's the essential evidence. The fingerprint evidence, that also um, is the material evidence. Reginald Reed. You have limited time. I, At any rate, I, got my answer, I, yeah. I apologize. No, um, you're fine. Um, in terms of whether or not, um, assuming that this instruction was legally and factually appropriate, whether it was harmless, um, I would, again, submit to the court that the jury saw uh, Reginald Reed testify, they were aware of his previous misidentifications, and he was adamant on the stand, I think that comes through in the transcript, that it was the defendant that um, he saw driving JJ's vehicle. Uh, the jury was free to accept or reject those facts um, in coming to their overall decision. Um, and ultimately, um, I submit to the court that when you have fingerprint evidence, when you have um, this DNA evidence, uh, that his in-court identification more or less becomes immaterial. Um, the court has the uh, DNA report in the file for it. I believe it's in volume two somewhere. And the probabilities are astronomically large. Uh, I believe that the lowest um, is in the 50 millions I want to briefly address uh, issue two, um, and I want to be very clear, the defendant wants this court to adopt a pre-indictment uh, charging test and wants to, uh, wants to permit a court to find a due process violation uh, without a showing of prejudice to a defendant and without showing bad faith on the part of the state. Um, United States v. Marion, that is that was properly interpreted by this court in Royal, and you know that because it was um, adopted 
it was reinforced even more so in the United States versus Lubasco a few years later. Um, I cited in my brief uh, Fifth, Cir Fifth Circuit case, uh, State v. Crouch, that goes through and lists all the jurisdictions that have adopted uh, the same test uh, that uh, Royal has. And I want to be clear that um, in this case, no prejudice to the defendant was demonstrated and no bad faith on the part of the prosecution uh, was established also. Touching just very briefly on the- Can I ask you, do you agree with um, opposing counsel's position on what the ruling was from the district court on that issue as to whether or not there was prejudice? What was the district court's finding? My reading of the district court's um, ruling is that uh, she did not find prejudice, um, nor did she find bad faith on the part of the state. Um, it's tough. I think that the difficulty in reading the opinion is the district court is trying to articulate its finding a negative. Um, but if this court had found prejudice, I think that would have been more clear in the ruling. If the court had found bad faith, it would have said, find, I find bad faith on the part of the state. And I do mention this in my brief. I realize I'm out of time. Um, uh, just uh, the, the only reason given on the record for why the district attorney back in 2003, 2004 did not file charges ostensibly was because they wanted to find a murder weapon. Police were not able to do that. And essentially, um, years down the road, different assistant district attorneys reviewed this case and thought that probable cause did exist and did seek charges. Um, I see that I'm out of time. If I may briefly uh, wrap up, unless there are any other questions. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice. Uh, none of the arguments that the defendant has made today um, justify reversal in this case. There has been no due process deprivation in either the sufficiency of the evidence or in the state's closing arguments. I would ask the court to affirm the defendant's uh, convictions. Thank you. May it please the court. Um, I would like to begin by going back to Justice Rosen's question. Yes, Mr. Ray was called Reverend Ray throughout the trial. Um, but I, th I think we get back to this point of what's, that, what's the relevance of this? What is the relevance of how he was left there when there is no evidence? And I, and I guess the point is, as Justice Biles pointed out, oh, sorry. Is, is that did the defendant, I, I, I was curious about that because how familiar the jury was with his role in the community. But... What, what knowledge did the defendant have at the time of the crime that, that he was a, a There is absolutely none from this record. The, the, there is no. Why, uh, why does that matter when we're trying to determine whether this is prosecutorial error? Because the, without that, the, the prosecutor's evidence on pre, or argument on premeditation here is that they knew he was a pastor and they left him like well, a crucifix. The, the argument, I mean, and I just read it from yeah. the transcript is and this may still be improper, but the prosecutor never says he knew he was a pastor, that's why he left him, left his body in this position. The prosecutor says the body was left in this position, and I submit to you, and then says, and the, the decedent was a pastor, and I submit to you, the jury, that this evidence suggests that whoever left his body there knew he was a pastor. And that's fine, but there's no evidence that Mr. Shields knows, kn knows them. And again, the, the, the evidence is the picture. That's what the prosecutor's arguing. The prosecutor's not trying to argue that there's other evidence that he knew he was a pastor. And again, maybe this is still an improper way of I, 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 I believe this is highly improper. This is highly inflammatory. But why? That's what I'm asking. Because this is distracting the jury from whether or not Mr. Shields killed these two people with premeditation and directing the jury for sympathy for this pastor and his... What was, was the fact or not fact of whether or not the murderer knew the victims, wasn't, was that important in this case? Did it matter? To the extent that 
there's no evidence that Mr. Shields knows these people, then that is important of showing Mr. Shields did not do this. Well, okay. The, again, this is just a way to cover some of the issues with the case. We don't have any evidence that Mr. Shields did this. I guess what I'm saying, just to cut to the chase, is as I read the prosecutor's statement, all the prosecutor is saying to the jury is, hey, whoever did this murder knew the victims. And, and, and why again, is that improper? Because it has no other relevance to Mr. Shields. Now, if there was some evidence that Mr. Shields knew these people and then we have these people there, then you can make that connection. Why can't the prosecutor make an argument about whoever did this murder? On the one hand, this gets back to Justice Standridge's questions. And then on the other hand, say, and because of the physical evidence, we know that whoever did it was the defendant. Which, again, you cannot make that connection because of the three-day time period we have here with the disappearance, and we can't say enough. We simply have no information. Um, Doesn't that even cut in your favor? If the evidence presented at trial was that your client did not know him at all, let alone that he was a pastor, and then the state in closing argument makes an argument that whoever killed him knew him, I mean, doesn't that help your case? It helps the case if you're looking at this from a calm and rational point. But if you're saying this man of the cloth got murdered and we need answers, we need to punish him. And this, and this is, and, and again, when I talked about how intertwined these things are, when we go back to the testimony of, of Reginald Reed, which you think would be the only would be the only issue there, we have the prosecutorial error, and he was certain, 100 percent, 100 percent certain in court, he didn't waver at all. Melvin Shields is the man driving my cousin's car. The state is trying desperately to connect Melvin Shields to the murder. We have Melvin Shields connected to the crime scene, but we have no evidence connecting Mr. Shields to the murder that does not involve filling in blanks along the way. And this, and this evidence of the crucifix and this evidence of the car with the family and the baby in front of them, I actually have it if, if this court would like to see it. I, I implore this court to look at all the, all, all the exhibits, particularly exhibit 28, 29, exhibit 68 and 69. I actually have 28 and 29. I debated whether or not to show it because, frankly, the coroner spreading the victim's vagina wide open proves nothing and is just inflammatory, particularly when you also have images of this young mother holding her baby in front of this car that is not visible. This jury was primed to not view the evidence in a cool, calm, and collected manner, and that's the reason we get this conviction based on insufficient evidence, because there is no evidence showing Mr. Shields premeditated. And even if there was, the aiding and abetting instruction was factually and legally incorrect. Um, and I am way out of time, and I apologize, Your Honor. Um, May I, may I please just sum if there are no other questions? I have a question, if I may. Assuming that you start with agreeing w that there is a possibility that he did not know this person, you've got a couple of facts here. You've got the positioning of the body of Reverend Ray. That's just a fact. But I think the inference that he's left in a crucifix is just an unreasonable inference because you get that same positioning if you have somebody just grab arms, pull, and drop. Well, that's true, but the so, jury can look at that positioning and make a decision as to whether or not it looks like someone has been posed. Sure, but once you start making this argument that, of course, these people were posed and this had to be to send a message, then you start distracting the jury from actually determining the elements of the offense and you start getting but, into in inflammatory territory. But isn't another way of looking at it, I mean, the facts sometimes are simply unfortunate, but the facts are what they are. And can't you also read that positioning as a clue that the defendant did know he was a pastor because if the jury can look at that and say, yeah, that looks kind of like he was posed as Jesus on the cross, then that connection can be made that I think that indicates the defendant may have known this guy was a pastor. But even if that's the case, how does that, one, how does that get us any closer to intentional premeditated murder? And, and on top of this, the court in Chandler has said that inferences cannot be based on uncertain speculative as evidence raising a mere conjecture or possibility. And that is squarely where we're at here. This is 
if it's an inference at all, it's, it is the, certainly the weakest, weakest form of inferences out there. Certainly not an inference that can be pulled, pulled up and brought up into the closing arguments way, particularly because it doesn't prove anything. It does not prove a thing. It, may, it makes the jury assume, but the purpose of this is to direct the jury into these inflammatory statements and tie basically to cover up. And why why that, doesn't staging bodies, why isn't it some evidence of premeditation? Because there is no evidence that they're staged. Again, the, well, okay, that, that, but that, that, that it, take. Yeah. You have to accept the premise of my question, which is, let's just speak hypothetically, not about this case at all. You just have victims whose bodies are staged. Isn't that some evidence of pre premeditation? It could be, but it's not evidence of Mr. Shields' involvement in the premeditation. Right. I'm just Again, asking a real, a much more simple no, question. Yeah, which yes. Is, yes. I, I can't admit that that in some cases the staging of the body can be evidence of premeditation. In this case, no be given the time and given the fact that there is no evidence that they know. So yes, staging of the bodies can be premeditation in some instances, but this is not one of those cases. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Thank you. Court will take this matter under advisement.